Taiwan's got lots of good examples of companies that could be disruptors that, that gain a, a much larger share of the market as we start to deploy up and run globally. Taiwan has played a quite important role in promoting the 5G open network ecosystem uh, for the local ecosystem to take part in this initiative. We also hope to see more operators adopting this technology, of course, yeah? uh, as we see in Taiwan and the region. Hello everyone, I'm Maggie Zhao, Manager of Communication Industry Development Project Office related by Industrial Development Bureau, MOEA Taiwan. I'm your host today and welcome to this virtual program, Accelerating Development of 5G Open Networking, co-organized by IDB Telecom Info Project and Industrial Technology Research Institute. As a key enabler of 5G deployment globally, OpenRAN brought up a new opportunity for a wider range of companies to join the ecosystem. With specific research projects, such as the 5G Open Network Lab, unveiled by Taiwan government last August. We have conducted various activities, including plug-based webinars and showcases, in order to build up the energy of the development. I trust you have also felt the momentum from the video in the opening. In light of recent announcement for this Taiwan 5G Open Network Lab to become the newest addition to Telecom Infra Project's community lab in Asia, aiming for integration tap service, Taiwan has always been a great partner to global ICT ecosystem, especially with the recent 5G commercial launch, open range and disaggregating network development. These are also Taiwan industry's key focus. Therefore, the program today, we are delighted to invite several ecosystem partners, including TIP, the global organization that drives the development of infrastructure and solutions to advance global connectivity. Any operator as a real user for this open architecture network and the equipment vendors with products and solutions that are ready for the market to share their insight in this regard, also the value and challenges they have seen from their experience, and how we can work together to accelerate the development of 5G open networking. So now, without further ado, let us welcome our first speaker, Dr. Yong Han Chen, the technical manager from EG and he will talk more about the Taiwan 5G Open Network Lab I just mentioned. Dr. Chen, please. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Yonghan Chen from Communication Industry Development Project Office, E3. Today, uh, in my presentations, I would like to share you about some information of 5G Open Network's development in Taiwan. Uh, first, I would like to talk about the uh, Taiwan 5G Open Networks. Uh, we all know that open networks, uh, open RANs, uh, are the most concerned ICT topics in the world uh, in recent years. Many Taiwan ICT companies are putting more and more efforts in open networks, uh, especially in open RAN, uh, because of the potential market opportunities. So uh, here are some observations. According to the statistics in 2019, there are around 20 million 3G and 4G base stations, and uh, it is estimated that there will be uh, much more 5G base stations due to uh, wider and higher frequencies and the more local private applications. So in order to decrease the cost of infrastructure, operators and uh, service providers uh, are uh, finding ways to make CAPEX and OPEX lower. So open networks, uh, including open RAN, are the solutions they anticipate. In the developments of open networks, uh, there are major four parts. Uh, the fundamental two parts are open hardware and software disaggregation. Uh, open hardware, uh, usually called white box, is highly flexible to integrate with uh, various uh, network function software. Uh, many ICT companies in Taiwan are good on white box OEM, ODM, 
And uh, this is also the start point that these companies uh, get involved. Then open interfaces are required to integrate hardware and software and among different network entities as well. It is also need open management to operate, manage, uh, control, and monitor the network system. And how to make sure that the network entities work well when put them together? It requires a lot of tests and verifications uh, with many aspects of uh, conditions and uh, configurations. So uh, tests and verifications play key roles to make the system successfully operable. Uh, in Taiwan, we have a comprehensive and a strong ecosystem to develop open networks, including IT and CT industries with high efficiency manufacturing. Many Taiwan companies have global branches and uh, subsidiaries and also have a high market share. A couple of uh, system integrators are becoming aggressive in uh, open networking because they have more choices to build up solutions for their customers and they are very open to cooperate with uh, domestic and international partners. Uh, we noticed that several ICT companies start uh, open network product from uh, access and uh, transport. Uh, most of them have uh, strong capabilities and uh, experiences of OEM and, and ODM. Some companies are quite active uh, in global open network communities such as uh, TIP, uh, Orient Alliance, OCP, ONF, OPNFV, and etc. So now I would like to uh, talk about ETRI's Open Network Laboratory. In uh, 2015, we started to build a telecom system testbed uh, to accelerate 4G development and the deployment. The partners, including global tier one vendors and uh, suppliers, worked with us to establish the testbed. And we have been aware of the trend on Open Network since uh, 2018. So now we're going to upgrade and extend it, the testbed to 5G open networks. Uh, Industrial Development Bureau in Ministry of uh, Economic Affairs and ETRI started to sponsor and promote open network and open source since 2019. And the goal is to assist accelerate commercialization of open networks. One of the work items is the uh, product and the solution verifications through test. In 2020, a 5G open network laboratory was established. We started the 5G NSA architecture uh, shown in the left hand side of this slide. We built up reference network with the domestic open RAN ENOB GNOB provider and uh, the uh, NSA core was uh, supported by Cisco and uh, cooperated with uh, Qualcomm, which is a local uh, system integrator. In this year, we're going to extend to the uh, multiple uh, 5G cores environment, uh, the SA architecture uh, as shown in the right hand side uh, of this slide. In the 5G open network multi-core laboratory, uh, we will continue to test and verify interoperability of open RANs and cores, connectivity of 5G cores uh, could be located on site test or remotely linked through VPN uh, to other labs, data centers, or uh, clouds. So, in addition, some new technologies and uh, products, uh, such as disaggregated cell site router, edge computing uh, with user prime function for local breakout and open front hole connectivity and uh, interoperability, uh, network management with a uh, radio intelligence controller, and so on. Uh, will be uh, integrated and uh, verified in the lab as well. And we also plan for your roadmap of uh, tests and verifications in the lab, including uh, various interworking, interoperability, uh, performance tests, and uh, field trials. Uh, in last year, we've done uh, some open RAN interop tests with NSA architecture. In this year, we are going to uh, do some open RAN and 5G core SA interop, uh, open front hall tests and a radio intelligence control integration trials. Uh, in the next two years, uh, more advanced tests and verifications are uh, under plan. And this slide shows three tests and profits activities held in last year. A couple of uh, Taiwan companies joined and uh, collaborate with uh, one another, including operator uh, Chonghua Telecom 
uh, RAM manufacturer like uh, Pepatron, uh, Foxconn, QCT, Lions, UV Space, and of course uh, from Cisco and the Polaris. We also help uh, these uh, companies to demonstrate and uh, promote their achievements in local and global uh, expos or events. Finally, our goal is to see the uh, commercialization and real adoptions using open network products and the solutions. So some other corporations and organizations focus on uh, private networks and uh, vertical applications uh, such as uh, healthcare, smart manufacturing, connected car and self-driving, and uh, recreation-related innovations. We will also uh, continue to cooperate with them and for open networks, uh, solutions, tests, and verifications uh, with considerations of real-world uh, considerations. So that's my presentation today. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, Dr. Chen, for the introduction on the lab. And now let us move to the panel session to hear more thought and insight from our industry. Uh, I would like to invite the panelists and our moderator to join the discussion. So let's work on our panelists. Uh, Mr. David Hilton, Chief Engineer, Sherkan Infra Project. Hello, David. Hi, it's great to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. And let's welcome Pat Keith and Spear, the Senior Vice President, Head of Technology Strategy Partnership, Indosat. Hello, Keith. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Hello. And let's welcome Matt Roman, Vice President of Marketing and Product Management, HCore Networks. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here. Hello, Matt. And we have CY Fong. General Manager of Pickup BU6 Pickertron Corporation. Very nice to meet you. And let's welcome Honan Chen, CTO with Strong New Web Corporation. Hello. Hello, everyone. Pleasure to be here. Hello, and let's welcome Aaron Zhang, Director of Tangba Electronics Incorporated. Hello, Aaron. Hi. Yes. Uh, nice to be here to meet you. Yeah, and please join me to work on our moderator, Howard Cao, CTO of Communication Industry Development Project Office, delayed by IDBMOEA. So Howard, now you may have the floor. Okay, thank you, Maggie. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Howard. I'm the moderator of today's panel. As we uh, understand that for the last uh, three or four years, the open architecture seems like uh, uh, getting mature and mature in the ICT industry. So I would like to uh, welcome several questions uh, and get your feedback on this. The first uh, question uh, addressed is we want to, uh, how mature is the, uh, the current state of full openness of the, uh, the RAM? <clears throat> because a lot of people talk about the technologies are evolving very fast uh, during these uh, three years. So I will, let me welcome uh, David, probably from a tip uh, perspective, you are pushing very hard on this open architecture on RAM on the mobile for mobile industry. So what's your, how do you think about how mature the current status in this market? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Howard. Thank you. Um, so when we started looking back at this, probably about in 2016, um, that's when TIP was founded. Open RAM was one of our first project groups to be established. It was really the drive from the operator community that, that saw this as a, as a priority area for us to, to focus on. So back then, you know, the idea was to see if, if it was actually possible to have a disaggregated solution in the RAN, if we had you know, uh, general purpose processes and the hardware and moving towards a software-based solution, would this kind of proof of concept model actually, actually work? And, and it did, which was great. Mm -hmm. um, so then the next step for us was to see, can we move beyond that proof of concept and satisfy the requirements that are really in commercial networks and take this into the field and, and trial this. So in, in 2018, Telefonica and Vodafone published a, uh, an RFI, a joint RFI together, that was looking at 2G to 4G um, using uh, you know, RRH and BBU split because back then the ORAN Alliance um, you know, uh, split wasn't, wasn't available uh, in various different frequency bands from 700 megahertz all the way up to, to 2.6 gig. 
And, and the results of these were published back in, in 2019. Um, we have that within an open round Turkey trials playbook that, that shows the level of KPIs that were achieved um, and compare those against some of the incumbent solutions that they already had within that network deployment. And the good news is that that was almost equivalent, if not outperforming some of the KPIs in some of those areas. So we took the understandings and the lessons learned from there, and, and we're, we're really now focusing on purely on commercialization generating scale. So our, our setup within TIP is looking at um, outdoor macro cells, um, indoor small cells, and we have specific um, what we call component groups that are looking at white box RU, DUCU, and with a heavy focus, and these are new initiatives on, on the, the RAN intelligence uh, and, and automation, and orchestration and, and, and management, um, two very important areas that are attracting a lot of intention, as, as I think we, we saw in, in the presentation from, uh, from Dr. Chen, the, uh, the RIC that's being developed with non-real-time and near-real-time uh, applications is, is something that could also be a game changer, not just for disaggregation. So we, we have commercial trials that are ongoing in, in every region of the world, you know, from North America to Latin America, Europe, and and specifically, you know, today talking about the, the Asia Pacific area. Um, and we've been publishing uh, test reports and recently, just this week, actually, we've published a test report from Indosat Oridu, which is great to see the progress that they're making there. Um, so we're seeing commercial scale and, and that's that's what we're driving towards as, as a community. Okay. okay, thank you. Interesting. So Matt, uh, from your perspective, you are from a transport uh, network component manufacturer, right? So how do you see this? How mature the, uh, the open architecture uh, look like? Yeah, so from the transport, both you know, access, aggregation, and, and optical, um, you know, we, we see a, a lot of activity, certainly you know, lots of trials, RFIs, RFPs, and we, have, and we see production deployments. So it's, you know, it's definitely, relatively speaking, early days, but um, you know, our hardware designs, um, Coupled with our software ecosystem partners, we can put together, you know, a very deployable and, and proven solution. So we see, you know, a, a lot of a lot of traction. Obviously, there's a long way to go, um, you know, to, to get this technology, you know, more broadly rolled out. But uh, you know, we see really strong traction. Oh, okay, interesting. So, Cy, how do you see these uh, from your company's perspective? Uh, first of all, I would say offering four concepts or a uh, technology concept uh, from the company like us uh, for product development, I will say it, it was pretty much approved based on so many POC or based on our uh, own development testing result that can fully uh, re reveal for that. that that's a pretty sure. Uh, just like a uh, building, we want to make it uh, make a building. So you, you need to start the one layer uh, after another. So direction is clear and the direction is uh, we have to have the confidence to achieve for that. But just like the Matt mentioned, uh, indeed, that uh, is still early stage that ne we need some more time uh, to make everything happen. To take an example, for example, that uh, uh, during the development uh, period, we work with some of our partners. We, we even like uh, test equipment partners, uh, we, we need to work with them and to uh, we provide some more test case to them to help them to complete hold the test case that uh, library to make sure that uh, that can serve uh, for all the other developers. So I think that uh, for Orin, this direction definitely clear, and I all fully align with Matt and David's comments. But just uh, sometime that's for sure. Okay, thank you. Next is uh, Horan. You know, from your company's perspective, how do you see these, how mature the openness of the RAN? Uh, we've seen Orange moving very quickly toward maturity based on a number of observations that uh, we see. One, number of reputable hardware software system companies and SIs announcing their Orange product plans. Two, uh, Orange has published more than 50 functional interface and test specs from working group one through nine and uh, TIFG. There is a growing availability of the Orient test equipment. There is a growing number of RFI, RFP, RFQs from 
mobile operators to procure mm-hmm. all products. There has been a liaison agreement between TIP and Orient Alliance to streamline their effort. We also see a growing number of MMOs indicating their interest and commitment to Orient, including the recent white paper published by five major European operators mm-hmm. uh, in their requirements for the ORAN. And recently, we saw the cherry release of ORAN open software, which uh, include significant advancement to integrate all the architectural components, SMOs, RIG, and uh, open Gino B into this total software release. That's okay. my comment. All right, interesting. Uh, Keith, since you are, you are from Telco, right? You work also uh, pretty much close to uh, TIP. So what is the, uh, the progress of IO uh, cooperate with TIP uh, status? Can you give us some uh, feedback on this? Thank you very much. It's a good question. Actually, I'm um, uh, happy to, uh, to, to hear also David's comments that, uh, about the, uh, the successful test results that, uh, that were published uh, this, uh, this week. So I would say it's, uh, it's excellent progress. Uh, so we started our partnership um, uh, last year, and um, you know, this year we spent a lot of time yeah, putting Open RAN in the uh, in the operational network with real customers on it. We started first with putting it in uh, more of a control environment just to make sure that all of the integrations with our existing core work, um, and then we installed it, um, uh, if I remember correctly, at 14 sites in uh, the Maluku area in Indonesia. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Indonesia, but Maluku, uh, that is uh, quite far away from, uh, from Jakarta. It's uh, quite a challenging region. Uh, from a logistics perspective, also from a transport perspective, from uh, an installation uh, uh, perspective. Uh, but we implemented it there, uh, integrated it with our, our core network, uh, existing core network, and I'm happy to say that it uh, yeah, functions very, very well. Uh, so we put it to a uh, yeah, challenging test um, and because, of course, real customers go on it. Um, so we tested it with our LTE uh, 900 uh, spectrum, um, and um, yeah, the speech that we got out of it is uh, yeah, as uh, expected. Um, also, all the services function uh, as expected. So, yeah, the results actually are, are very good. So, yeah, to answer also your question on the maturity, um, I think Open RAN is reaching the, the maturity that is uh, that is required. We have proven, uh, and as an operator, we're very critical on those things. We have proven that it works uh, in an operational network, uh, integrating with an existing incumbent uh, core network vendor, um, and being installed in uh, quite a challenging uh, en- environment. So, we're quite happy with that progress. Okay. Well, well, just one uh, quick question for you. How do you think the uh, because the you are bringing more new vendors for the mobile network, right? So, do you how you work with the uh, the so-called traditional suppliers because they are the SI for existing uh, mobile network, right? So, if you bring in the more open architecture product as an open RAN concept, so is it bringing new integrator to work with the uh, a traditional mobile supplier? At the same time? So it's a good question. So maybe I need to clarify here as well that the fact that we have trialed it in, uh, in, in those sites in Maluku, that's a trial. Uh, so once the trial is finished, of course, uh, we go back to um, yeah, our existing uh, the installation. Um, so also, as Indosat or we do, of course, uh, we're always looking at all of the, uh, yeah, the latest technologies. And um, of course, we'll work with our vendors to, um, yeah, to make sure that they, uh, they, they follow all of the latest uh, developments. So this is part of our ongoing discussions with uh, all of our uh, incumbent vendors who are actually doing an excellent job uh, supporting us. And uh, yeah, we're telling them that actually we expect them also to, uh, to move into uh, to that, uh, that, that, that direction. Um, and so far, those discussions with them have been very productive and, uh, and, and collaborative. Yeah, good to know, good to know. Great. Okay, Aaron. From your Hi. company's perspective, uh, how do you think the uh, the maturity of the uh, open architecture uh, product? Yeah, yeah, I think it's a very interesting question. Uh, among all the customers, we see the uh, some of the our customer is uh, asking for the competitive the cost. In this case, they may consider the uh, all in one device, but also many customers they ask for the open RAN product, uh, especially in the front hole, the open front hole uh, product. Uh, as for fastball and a larger scale uh, development. And another thing is that I observed is I want to echo the uh, David is uh, actually from the, the technical uh, question they want to solve is the uh, network optimization and config. This is the problem need to solve no matter traditional open RAN. So they, they will ask for the, the near real time rig product to manage the, the network optimization. Yeah, I think it's a very good uh, trend. We can, we can focus on this one. Okay, thank you. Well, since the uh, 
The open RAN and the disaggregate network technology is moving very fast uh, during these uh, few years. It not just the, uh, the separate this RUC, UDU for the RAN uh, itself, but also uh, disaggregate the hardware and the software. Okay. So how do you think the uh, one level of open RAN is can disaggregate network implementation with white box solutions? You know, especially uh, bringing all these white box hardware to be your network within the uh, next two years. If you are not a telco, but from your product uh, plan point of view, so how do you see the, the market size for the coming years, the coming two years? Let's uh, back to David. Uh, how do you see this? I, I think that there is a lot of focus on the box at the moment, and we see that because that's how we we structured our work based on what you know the uh, the ecosystem is is demanding, and that's coming from not only the the operator demand but also what what the vendors are are developing as well. So we we have within our structure, um, a number of component subgroups that are focusing on, on white box RU and, and white box DU and CU. So that's current work that's, that's already going on. For both of those, we've already developed and, and approved uh, a set of um, product uh, requirements that for the white box RU is looking at different combinations of um, single band, dual band and, and tri band uh, type of deployments as well. And for white box DU and CU, looking at various different splits as to where you know the, uh, the DU would be co-located with the, with the CU, would it be co-located with the RU as well? So we're at the stage now where we're moving into the testing aspect of of those solutions within our, our current release that we're developing. So I, I really liked Horan's comment in terms of um, the, the point of you know vendors having to provide test cases to test equipment manufacturers to help to build those test suites. I think test and validation is key to anything that is disaggregated within telecommunications as well. So one thing that we're trying to do within TIP is to embrace that with the community spirit as well and have common test plans that can be reused by um, all operators, all SIs, all, all vendors. Um, so we're developing those test plans now when we already are going through some testing activities of, of these white box products that are being developed now. So you say two years, I think actually you can probably see some white box products that are coming up on the market already, but I'll, I'll leave that to uh, to some of the, the vendors to, to speak towards that and, and to the operators as to when that will go into field. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your feedback. So from the manufacturing or product point of view, uh, CY, can you give us some uh, feedback on this? As a matter of fact, it's all range, uh, open structures. Uh, already kind of the identified the white box uh, model. And the most beautiful thing is that uh, with the uh, virtualization for the solar structures that make the white box system white box become uh, even more feasible. So I think that I also <laughs> agree with David's comments that uh, that definitely will be a kind of attraction for all the developers to go for that direction. Uh, so I think that's uh, different, that's, uh, that's the way. And uh, so I think uh, at this moment, indeed, uh, from our point of view, that's uh, based on the hardware and software developments uh, result, I, I truly cannot see any blocking point not to let uh, developers go for this direction. So I, I think it's pretty, pretty nature. So that will, that will depends on the future's uh, business model uh, to see how that will go, because that's uh, after all that uh, still depends on, just like the Aaron mentioned, that uh, no matter incumbent uh, vendors or the new vendors, uh, we need to provide the right solution to operators, to our customers with the best uh, optimization cost and also optimization uh, time schedules, and, uh, and that's uh, quite a lot of index that uh, we, we need to solve and help, help on. So I, I think that uh, to go for the high box is, uh, from my point of view, it's a kind of the nature way, but it uh, depends on still kind of depends on future business corporations, uh, which way is the best for the customers. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. So, Aaron, how do you think uh, from your perspective? On top of the, the white box solution, we observe the performance of the white box have the big improvement in the uh, time. 
especially on the traditional, we have some the FPGA solution, and uh, now transform to the ASIC solution. In terms of this one, we saw a lot of the performance improvement. So we think to provide a separate hardware software solution, we may see by product. I mean, in terms of the quality uh, cost will be available in the market in the these two years. Yeah. Okay. Next, Poren. Yeah. How do you think the authority of the market of the coming years? <laughs> good. Good question. From my company standpoint, we've been working very hard to develop the RU and uh, working with other partners to enable DUCU. Uh, based on the progress we have and the testing we have done so far, I think we will be ready to comply with the Orin RU spec by end of the year and integrate uh, our system test together with DUCU to show end-to-end -end performance around the same time frame with a very strong indication that uh, the initial performance would be quite good compared with the traditional uh, system. We still look into the future to uh, use this type of system in our own private network. As a company, we have uh, a number of manufacturing sites and we plan to use uh, ORAN products, our own ORAN products in our own smart factory trials. Uh, at least the four locations. And we will also be using the Orin uh, product for our smart roadside unit product development, where we have strong capability in uh, Xero V2X products and software related uh, integration to introduce that to uh, smart transportation and advanced uh, driver assistance systems. So we see with all of this going on, uh, reading about the market penetration, uh, there are a lot of indication in the showing that the market will start to pick up quite quickly from next year for all rent products and probably going to capture about 10% market share in two years and then capture about 75% market share in eight years. So that is good news for all of us. No, oh, interesting. Uh, Keith, you are working on this uh, open RAN uh, project already. For, for the future, everybody's talking about 5G network. Uh, it's going to be uh, uh, implemented a lot of places. Okay. So how I will see the uh, importance of openness on network in relation to uh, with their plan towards 5G technologies. Uh, do you have any uh, plan for this? A very big plan actually, and it's um, yeah, to answer your question specifically, it's very important. It's actually critical in uh, in our opinion. So, uh, so if um, yeah, our vision for for the future network is uh, is a network which is uh, which is fully open. Um, in, um, in all different uh, uh, directions. So, um, and one of the reasons that we want to open network is because we don't want to depend only on the innovation of a limited uh, set of uh, providers, a limited set of companies, uh, but we really want to create an, an open ecosystem where yeah, many companies, many yeah, even universities uh, or local entrepreneurs can develop uh, yeah, uh, on top of, uh, of that. So, uh, and the same applies to, to open RAN. So that's why we actually are looking forward to have uh, yeah, this open uh, architecture. Uh, and that we are looking forward to see uh, developers from Indonesia, maybe also from Taiwan, anywhere else in the world to create solutions to, that help us improve this uh, this architecture and to create uh, yeah, applications and solutions beyond our wildest imagination. So that's what we're looking forward to. So it's critical to be open uh, to the, you know, the 5G network architecture that at least Indosat is uh, uh, planning for the future. Okay, thank you. Next, uh, Matt, how do you see these, uh, the white box solutions from transport point of view? So for, for us as, as EdgeCore, I mean, the white box is our business, right? So it sort of started in the data center, you know, so we're, we're, we're all in, as, as, you, as we say, um, on this. But no, again, EdgeCore is focused on, on the transport side, um, but definitely we're expecting, you know, steep growth. And again, just the, I guess the indicators that, that I look to are the, the trials, um, the RFPs, the RFIs, and, and there's just a, a tremendous amount of activity. Um, certainly TIP is, is helping cultivate that and, and drive that, which is great for, you know, for all of us. You know, what we see particular strength, say, f further out into the transport network, particularly in that in the DCSG area. Uh, mm -hmm. So just, you know, a ton of activity going on there. Um, you know, and, and, and I think one of the other things that will really help drive this growth is, you know, there's a really strong software ecosystem of either, uh, you know, uh, network operating system NOS vendors or software orchestration vendors that are, you know, that can provide, you know, a, a validated 
uh, solution. So, you know, from my view, I, you know, it's definitely starting there. That's where, where that traction is. And then I would say a little further up into the network at the aggregation uh, layer, um, we see, you know, particular strength there with, you know, just the normal sort of speeds and feeds from a 25 gig, or excuse me, from a 10 gig to a, to a 25 gig or 100 gig. And then, um, and then also at sort of out at the edge, the, you know, the, the, the emerging requirements for some of these 5G focused features are really driving, um, you know, new next generation silicon and, and you know, operators going to need to get that technology. And I think if, if we as a, you know, in the industry um, can can deliver proven solutions that provide that same comfortable experience, um, then I think that will really fuel this growth over the next couple of years. Thank you. Thank you for your feedback. Since the, uh, the open uh, networking is so popular, as everybody I heard from the industry is everybody's marching for uh, for these directions. Right. So if you bring in the new ecosystem or new suppliers, whatever is the system integrators or it's a new product suppliers, and the testing is a key. Panelist has already mentioned this, right? So how to conduct the end-to-end -end test, the interops test, all these uh, all functional tests or feature tests. So somebody has to bring all these together. Uh, a term I call it is a very system integrated role, uh, just like the uh, Ericsson or Nokia or Huawei, uh, ZTE, uh, these kind of companies, they not, not just provide the, the product, they integrate the network, but also the, the services. I would say they are the, the service integration as integrator as well, okay? Because all these logistic, once they implemented the logistic behind the, uh, after the implementation, the OT part is uh, also very important for the telco or the, uh, or even for the private network operators or private network uh, end users or owners, right? So this coming to the next question I will address, what value of the third party ORAN and this aggregate network integration lab? can benefit the industry, you know, from uh, to telcos, the end users, or uh, for the uh, product suppliers from different angles, if you see this. So what kind of value it can bring to the uh, industry, this uh, integration test or product test lab, okay? So uh, this will back like to Aaron. Aaron, probably you will be the first. I see the, in terms of the, our point of view, the, the integration lab provides some the opportunity for us to uh, integrate uh, with the other third party. In our case, actually, we already co-working with the uh, e in the, some part of the uh, department, including the RAIN uh, optimization team. And they are also the, we have uh, integrated in the core part. So all of these experiences together, our product, including the RAN and uh, the UE side, uh, provide uh, our the good opportunity to uh, work together. Before we actually have chance to go into our the end customer, we have a chance to team up and the practice uh, for all these features. So if the, also the, it's very positive to us because the, uh, based on this experience, we actually have some team up activity with all these party to go for next step. Yeah. Okay. Uh, CY, how do you think? Okay. We plan that uh, it might be better to have the operators take the ownership uh, to run the lab and approve the products because the user is also uh, make the user become approval uh, people to which might make the industry move faster. Uh, somehow, it's uh, yeah, personal. I, I also uh, more kind of it's uh, my personal point of view. That uh, I, I would say I'm kind of fan of the support lab, and because that it really make the open system, open uh, structures become really, really to be open. And just like the E3 to establish the lab, and also our cooperation with E3 really shows that positive point. And uh, also back to the industry history. The smell fact that uh, lots of the examples uh, tell us that to make things uh, become open, that will really boost up the industry faster. So I think to have the third party lab to work on all of this kind of the integration certification, I would say uh, it will definitely help operators and also will help our developers. Uh, so I think uh, and back to the to the real situation. Keys already identifies that uh, the Orient itself has a uh, kind of the traction uh, provide a benefit to operators. So I think uh, it's not the really uh, necessary factors to have the operators to run for the lab. To have the third party lab, I personally believe that's uh, definitely the right way. Okay. 
Thank you. David, since uh, TIP owns a lot of testing lab around the globe, right? So how do you think about this? Yeah, I, I would say, first of all, we, we don't own those testing labs. Our, our members um, host those, those labs. Okay. Um, and we, we just help to facilitate those types of activities, as I think Matthew was talking about before with what we've done with DCSG, Cassini, and, and, and now with Phoenix as well. So I think from, from a TIP perspective, yeah, we definitely want to see more innovation. We want to have a healthier vendor ecosystem. We want to allow operators to be able to select best of breed components, but also to be able to interchange those individual components when they like. So integration testing is extremely necessary as part of anything that we do with disaggregated technology. So TIP is not a traditional standards body, for instance. We don't write technical specifications for interfaces. We leave that up to the, the three GVPs, the ORAN alliances of this world. But what we do is that we will productize that and then we will test and validate that. And that's key to what we do and, and how we facilitate that. So it becomes even more important when it's a d disaggregated solution to make it viable for operators to understand how to aggregate it into an actual network deployment. So our philosophy is ultimately test once and then deploy it multiple times. But this is going to require a change of philosophy by operators because the traditional way is that you get everybody into your own lab environment and you test it and you know that will sort out your deployment. We prefer a more community-based approach because we also understand that with new vendors or often smaller companies who can't support multiple testing activities in every single operator's lab around the world. So this is why we've developed a badging system as part of our test and validation work that helps to show and indicate the level of product maturity. So this is from the first step of a vendor declaring I am requirements compliant to that product requirements document that you have to then validating it against a common test plan to it being validated within a TIP lab facility uh, to show that it's a TIP validated product or solution. And we show that on our, our TIP exchange. So the idea there is to give operators the confidence to know that the products can be integrated and deployed successfully within their networks without a large overhead. And as part of that, that work, SIs take part in, in those activities and are shown that they are an integral part of this environment. Now, the use of neutral lab environments, I, I think, can be a good way forward. I think it lowers the amount of resources that the individual operators themselves need to put towards their own test and validation activities. You know, if you strip away 75% of their testing because it's the common baseline that all operators are doing and you do it once within an environment, it saves them their own resources, it saves them, you know, a, a bit of their own testing budget. And it also saves the individual vendors having to repeat the same tests over and over again. So it, it still allows everybody to differentiate because you're only testing that common baseline and innovation will go beyond and, and that's how vendors will differentiate and how operators will continue to differentiate as well. But the overall goal here is to save time and money and accelerate the time to market of, of these products that we're, we're um, defining as a community. Okay, thank you for your feedback. All right. Uh, how do you think the third-party lab can, can benefit from your perspective? Two major benefits of this third-party lab to me are proving the interoperability of multiple vendor products and uh, proving the end-to-end system integrated performance. And this became very clear to me when we uh, developed the first 5G UEs, CPEs, and then testing against Ericsson, Nokia, Samsung, networks, and found out uh, even for traditional RAN suppliers, they did not interpret spec the same way. Our CPE from one SOC vendor would probably work with one equipment provider, but not the other two. And it have goes through many, many tests to clarify uh, a lot of uh, issues. Now, with this kind of ORAN architecture, I think we have similar problem. Even there's a 3 g spec, this ORAN spec, everybody would interpret these specs slightly differently. And these spec may not define all the details clearly. There are some minor details subject to your own interpretation. So as you run those tests, you'll find out a lot of interoperability problems. Having a neutral lab helps because then you cannot say it's my problem. You know, uh, in the past, the X 
the Ericsson, Nokia, Samsung people would tell me, it's your CPE problem. You got to fix it because we're the infrastructure. We are the, the standard. And some cases, no, we have to fight that battle. Here, you got a neutral lab who uh, play a, a level headed uh, role to figure out if this problem happened to just one vendor or two other vendors as well. In addition, we have test equipment vendors who will also be in the loop to uh, look at some of the problems. We uh, went to the second plug fest for Oran last year, and uh, we participated and went test at the uh, Telecom Italia lab, and we found out we had a lot of failures. And in the end, it was the test equipment problem. They did not implement the security algorithm, encryption algorithm correctly. After working with them to resolve that, we passed 10 test cases for end-to-end, the large number of test cases in that second plug fest in uh, Telecom Italia. So I think this IoT, this interoperability testing is very crucial to figure out where the problem come from and uh, have and uh, all these different vendors and equipment providers working together with Test Lab, it will help the whole ecosystem more mature. And once you integrate all the different components together, you still have to find out if the end-to-end performance uh, can achieve parity with a traditional closed proprietary system. And this is a good uh, place to verify that before you go to the field. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, uh, Matt. Uh, since you are, has already your company started already all these kind of testing in the uh, data center environment before, right? So how do you think the uh, the third party lab can help? Yeah, so the co-panelists have, have said it well. Definitely agree with everything that's been said. I guess really it's, it's probably pretty apparent, but from my perspective, one of the biggest inhibitors for you know acceptance and, ro- or, and rollout of open network technology is to be able to you know to prove that these systems work and as as a number of the panelists have said, are, are interoperable with you know with multiple vendors. And that's you know there's there's a lot of work to be able to show and prove that. So to me, the the value of this lab would be it's, it's as it's an independent third party. Uh, environment where we can leverage, you know, the, the work of, of each of the different ecosystem participants, if you will, and really show and prove. And as David said, not continuously every single engagement have to go back, you know, retest something that's, you know, 80% consistent. So, you know, so there's just from, from a, I'll say selfishly from a vendor perspective, you know, that's a, that's a lot of effort and activity to be able to do that. So really to me, the, the value of this lab is it's going to sort of lower the barrier of entry and, and allow this technology to, to be more rapidly deployed simply mm-hmm. so i think it's, it's great okay thank you all right uh let's start the next questions how do you see taiwan uh, ict industry can contributing to 5g landscape because i see uh, taiwan is a, a powerful ict manufacturing uh, base right so from your perspective how do you think um, under the open architecture or open ran umbrella the taiwanese ict industry can uh, contribute to the 5G landscape. Uh, I will start from DY. This company cannot uh, contribute that. I, I will be very, very frustrated <laughs> because it, uh, just like the Dr. Chen, Howard mentioned about the, the IT base of Taiwan Industrial. I think that's uh, kind of the orange is a very good opportunity for Taiwanese company uh, like Pegatron. I, I think that a company like Pegatron uh, to work on not only the hardware side, but also the software side. And on the other hand, the open structures makes us, just like we have discussed about the white products, uh, uh, white box products uh, concept, uh, let us to uh, our customers can be more, be open to discuss for the, for the product itself product benefit. So I, I think that's a, it's definitely, I believe, and I also represent Pegatron to share this concept. We definitely believe that a Taiwanese company can contribute. And uh, so I think that's a straightforward response uh, for this question. Thank you. All right. Uh, Hore, can you uh, give us some feedback? I think Taiwan is quite strong in terms of uh, electronics. And uh, if you look at the largest 10 global electronics EMS companies, Taiwan uh, has five of them. If you look at the ODM for electronics, that's even more surprising. Taiwan has 10 of the top 10 ODMs in electronics for the world. Company WNC is also the largest ODM for the networking products in Taiwan. We have uh, over 24 years experience in Wi-Fi, in cellular, in satellite communications, and automotive communications. We try to apply our expertise in RF antenna and uh, the design for uh, this type of uh, radio unit is fairly complex. 
from indoor pickle cell to outdoor macro cell, from low power, mid power to high power PA. You have to worry about linearity of the PA, you have to worry about ACLR, EVM, you have to worry about how to do pre distortion for the PA and maintaining the performance while meeting the thermal uh, requirements. All of this, plus the wide variety of frequency available for 5G make it very challenging. So we're very happy that uh, we are utilizing our know-how to contribute to this by having a uh, white box approach. We can focus on that alone and uh, do the best for that box and then leave the other uh, partners to worry about some of the other issues. So uh, I believe Taiwan has, uh, has a very good number of uh, high quality manufacturers. Once they design a product, they can also do very high quality manufacturing as is proven in the past. So I think together uh, with other partners in Taiwan, I think we can really make a big difference and become a major ecosystem for Oren. Okay, thank you. Next, yeah, uh, David, how do you see uh, Taiwanese ICT industry can contribute? I mean, Taiwan has an extremely vibrant ICT industry. There's there's absolutely no question about that. I think we saw in, in Dr. Chen's slide in, in the introduction, you know, the, the number of vendors that we have in the ecosystem for IT tech providers, network and communication equipment suppliers, system integrators, telecom service operators. And, and it's not just for 5G. I think there's, you know, uh, very strong in transport and back backhaul space, very strong in Wi-Fi strong in core as well. So I think it's complete end to end that we see a lot of value. And the, the great thing is that the, the companies themselves are, are strong and willing to engage in, in a community based approach um, within TIP. We have, we have Edge Core who are extremely active on our open optical and packet transport groups, Pegatron, Compal and Wistron. Basically, you're, we have a very strong panel here today that just goes to show how strong the ICT industry is within Taiwan. And and I, I would reiterate here as well that I think ITRI can play a major role here. As there's such a diverse range of technology and innovation with Taiwan, it's important to have a local lab environment for those technology suppliers to utilize and be recognized by the TIP community, which is why we're really pleased to have um, ITRI being approved as a TIP community lab. It's something that, that I'm very, very proud of. You know, it's recognized as being a leading R&D center in the region, but also worldwide. And, and I think, you know, the where we are in the situation with the global pandemic, I think having a local lab is, is quite important to accelerate what we're trying to do as as a global ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And we also saw from Dr. Chen that ITRI's had a number of successful open RAN and 5G core plug fest and activities throughout 2020. So they've got the right environment, the right skills, and that's going to add value to the community across the board for open RAN, open Wi-Fi, OOPT and, and beyond. Okay, thank you. Matt, so how, how do you think about this? I think you contribute a lot from the transport point of view, right? We do, yeah. I mentioned before the cell site routers, the David was just mentioning the optical. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're very active there. I, I guess to, to answer this specific question, you know, how, how do I see, I guess I can't see a scenario where Taiwan ICT won't contribute to, to 5G, as, as a number of the panelists have said, you know, it's it's the, you know, it's a global hub of technology, everything from silicon, silicon foundries, you know, innovative hardware designs, whether it's, you know, big routers or, or RF or, or other technology. And then of course, the manufacturing, the logistics, so, you know, all of the pieces are there. And, and again, it's to me, it's, you know, it's very obvious that that Taiwan ICT industry is going to is going to continue to play a strong role. And it's, you know, it's 5G now, but it was, you know, previous technologies. So, again, it's uh, to me, it's kind of a, a no brainer. It's it's there and, it, and it's happening and will continue. OK, good. Aaron, yeah. so what do you think? I think the, the Taiwan is the island of the ICT and uh, the Compo is one of the, the ICT group. So we make a lot of the electron device, over 20, over 50 millions of the device handset. So the for the 5G, I think that we can play no more than this one because actually we have the uh, open interface, open RAN. So actually we can make the common product, not just the ODN, OEMS. And then in this one, we have the neutral lab to facilitate this common interface and common product to build up uh, the environment lab which can make us uh, make the end-to-end -end solution yeah including the hardware and the software and to be a team of the Taiwan ICT uh, can contribute the more uh, product and the solution to the world okay 
Yeah. Thank you. Interesting. Okay, uh, I'll leave the last question to Keith. Uh, from telco point of view, can can you give us some feedback on how uh, what will be the challenges to implement open con openness concept to the network? That's a very good question. Actually, that's uh, one that is on the top of our agenda at the moment as we are working on our open RAN uh, uh, strategy. So the, the challenge I don't think is going to be technical. So so we have already proven also, and we have seen it in the, uh, in the trials that we are doing, and I think also all of those labs that, uh, that you guys were talking about really help that te technology works, uh, it integrates. What I see now as the, the main challenge is um, yeah, how do we deploy this at, at scale? So one of the advantages of the current uh, yeah, model that we have here, the traditional vendors, the Huawei, the Cities, the Nokia's, uh, the Ericsson's of this, uh, this world. So you give them one PO and they will deploy the cell site uh, in full. Of course, it's a bit more complicated than that, but uh, you don't really have to worry about all of the, uh, yeah, the complexity, how software works with uh, with hardware, because basically they take the end-to-end -end ownership of uh, of that. So so I think that is the yeah, the, the challenge. First, to, um, yeah, to, yeah, to find the right system, integrated companies uh, to do that. Um, system Integrators also have to step up, by the way, um, uh, to uh, to be able to uh, to do this. Uh, then, of course, as telcos, uh, for, yeah, to gain yeah, trust in those companies because we're used to working with uh, these big names, uh, not so much with the system integrator companies, at least when it comes to the network implementation. Um, and then, last but not least, um, I think the challenge will also be how do we prepare our people. Uh, to uh, to deal with new technology, uh, so of course the team will understand uh, yeah, the radio uh, the technology, but dealing with this new technology, um, yeah, in the fields, um, yeah, will be you know, some challenge. So we need to go through a, yeah, quite an extensive training process. Uh, not just the people in the NOC, but also the people in the field who are actually are yeah, maintaining all of this, uh, this this equipment. So, yeah, to summarize, I think the main challenges are going to be on the people side, training, uh, and on yeah the system integrator side. Yeah, can we get yeah good system integrators to uh, to step up, uh, and can we get them to do this uh, at scale in the same way like we uh, uh, do now with uh, the Ericsson's and the other big uh, companies of this world? Okay. Thank you. All right. I think the uh, our panel discussion the time is running out. Thank you very much for the panelists to give us all those uh, your valuable uh, feedback for the audience. Okay. Now I hand over the floor to uh, Maggie. Thank you, Howard, and thank you all for your sharing today to give our audience a very fruitful insight on how we can each play a part in building this healthy ecosystem. And due to the time limitation, our virtual program has to come to an end. A replay of this virtual program will be available very soon. So if you miss any content, you'll be able to catch up. And of course, you can always contact us via the event platform at MWC Barcelona 2021. So thanks once again to our panelists and our audience for taking a part. We will see you next time. Bye bye. Okay, thank you all. Thank you for your time. Thank you all. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Greetings from Indonesia. Bye bye. <laughs> thanks. <laughs>